Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us every other week for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. We're so glad you could join us. Today, we have an exciting episode planned for you as we discuss the STEMI and STEMI and the OMI NOMI paradigms. We will be joined by an expert in the field that will dive into both paradigms and help us better understand how we should be thinking about these. Let's get started. The ECG can detect myocardial injury and thus remains the most widely used diagnostic tool in the detection of acute myocardial infarction. Early detection of acute myocardial infarction can impact immediate patient care and long-term outcomes. For such reasons, ECG criteria have been devised to identify such patients and guide patient care. For instance, early recognition and immediate reperfusion therapy of patients with ST elevation MI are known to have better outcomes. Fortunately, most trained clinicians can detect these common STEMI patterns. However, there remains a large subset of patients that do not present with the typical STEMI patterns, yet they have similar underlying pathophysiology, that is, acute occlusive disease, and they would benefit from immediate reperfusion therapy. In fact, there are known ECG patterns that reflect this. However, these patterns are not widely known or accepted in current guidelines. In other words, we are aware of ECG patterns that can improve patient outcomes, although they are not yet implemented in clinical practice outside a relatively small group of clinicians with prior knowledge. And that brings us to our focus today, namely the problem with the current STEMI-non-STEMI -STEMI dichotomy. We will also look at what occlusion MI and non-occlusion MI, the OMI-NOMI paradigm, what that is. How can we make an occlusion MI diagnosis on the ECG outside of the STEMI criteria? And how can even a novice ECG interpreter learn how to recognize these occlusion MI patterns on the EKG? We'll be discussing this all today with one of the leading experts in the field on this topic. And with that said, let me introduce you to today's special guest, Dr. Stephen Smith. Dr. Smith has been on the Faculty of Emergency Medicine at Hennepin Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota since 1991. He has published extensively in emergency cardiac care, including on the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction with troponin, especially by way of the ECG. In fact, he has published a 38-chapter book entitled The ECG Diagnosis of Acute MI. He has written several other chapters, textbook sections, and dozens of peer-reviewed articles on the topic. In 2008, he began writing the now-famous Dr. Smith's ECG blog, a free open access site with over 1,300 posts highlighting complex ECG cases. It has garnered a worldwide following with nearly 20 million page views. His ECG insights are sufficiently insightful and cutting edge, and that he's gained a tremendous social media following with over 35,000 Twitter followers and over 80,000 Facebook followers. Since 2014, he has lectured on what he has coined the false STEMI, non-STEMI dichotomy. Recently, he and his colleagues introduced the occlusion MI paradigm as a replacement for the STEMI, non-STEMI paradigm. In promoting this new paradigm, he gave the annual keynote Rylant lecture at the annual meeting of the International Society of Electrocardiology and is expected to give the next keynote address this year to the International Society for Computerized Electrocardiology. Without further ado, Dr. Smith is with us. It's such an honor to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Anthony. Yeah, I've been, like I said, looking forward to uh, this conversation, such an important topic, and I don't want to waste any more time, so let's just dive right into it. And, you know, I think it's best for our audience, because this could be new to them, to first, you know, define what is that STEMI, non-STEMI dichotomy, or the paradigm, we call it, and, you know, what are the current problems with this existing paradigm? The problem with the STEMI, non-STEMI dichotomy is it relies not on the underlying pathology of occlusion, which leads to irreversible infarction of viable, otherwise viable myocardium, 
Uh, rather than relying on that underlying pathology, it relies on one aspect of the ECG, which is ST elevation. The EC, if you look at other aspects of the ECG, which include the entire QRST complex, and uh, that you can make the diagnosis of occlusion with much higher sensitivity than with ST elevation alone, but even that does not define the omi nomi uh, paradigm, because that paradigm is not defined by a test. It's defined by the underlying pathology. So in all of our studies of the ECG in occlusion myocardial infarction, we don't use the ST elevation or the QRS or any aspect of the ECG as our outcome variable. We use, did the patient have an occluded coronary artery at the time the ECG was recorded? And how can we correlate that underlying pathology with the ECG findings, which are manifold and not just ST elevation, and certainly not ST elevation of any specified millimeter or, or millivolt um, cutoff. So what we use is, so you, one might think, okay, just look at the angiogram. Was the, was the artery occluded at the time of the angiogram? And if it was, we say, yes, that, that correlates with the ECG. We're gonna call that ECG uh, an ECG of occlusion. But what if the artery is open? The, the problem is, there can be a culprit with an open artery that is open only at the time of the angiogram, but was closed at the time of the ECG. Now, how do we know this? Well, there are many studies about uh, with STEMI, people who truly meet STEMI criteria and are diagnosed with STEMI. By the time they get to the, an to the angiogram, which may be 30, 60, 90, or 120 minutes later, the artery is open one third of the time. Now, maybe Timmy one flow, Timmy two flow, or Timmy three flow, but 20% of the time, it's fully open with TIMI-3 flow. TIMI-3 means completely normal flow, flow through the artery. Now, remember that the ECG does not measure stenosis in an artery. It only measures perfusion of the, at the cellular level. So if the artery is completely open, I should say there can be a very severe stenosis, but have TIMI-3 flow. So the ECG will not detect that stenosis. It will only detect the absence of flow. Now, Let's say you, you have an ECG at the time of chest pain, and um, it shows maybe very subtle hypercute T waves. And uh, fortunately, someone recognizes that, and they take the patient to the, to the angiogram, and the angiogram shows it's open. Now you're confused. It showed hypercute T waves, but the angiogram's open. You have to remember that the artery is frequently open, even with a full blown STEMI. So how do we say, how do we determine whether that artery was closed or not at the time of the ECG? And what we've come to is, is we use a troponin, a peak troponin cutoff. Peak troponin is a pretty good measure of infarct size. Now it'd be better if we had other, other more exact measures like MRI, but we can't do MRI at, uh, at the time of the ECG. What we can do is find out what that troponin did. So, um, there are, uh, there are multiple cutoffs. We've used, for instance, in the past, using contemporary troponin I, which goes in nanograms per milliliter. We've used 10 nanograms per milliliter for troponin I. We've used one nanogram per milliliter for troponin T, because that's a much lower value. And that it turns out to be, a in previous literature on STEMI and non-STEMI, those were pretty good cutoffs differentiating between those two pathologies. So based on that, we've gone with uh, using a troponin cutoff in one study uh, by Dr. Aslanger in Turkey, which uh, I was a co-author on, we used five nanograms per milliliter for troponin I. Most of my studies have used 10 nan nanograms per milliliter as a cutoff. It's interesting that we find that in, in these studies, the exact same number of people who we say on our ECG have an occlusion, the exact same number have TIMI 0, 1, 2, and 3 flow as have on STEMI ECGs. Uh, so now, we Dr. know Smith, that I don't mean to interrupt yes. you, but there's a lot oh, here do. that you just said, and uh, it's kind of like mind blowing because uh, in some ways we rely on this STEMI, non-STEMI in our guidelines. You know, even though they mention some, I you know, additional criteria: persisting chest pain, hyperacute T waves. They mention some of these other findings, maybe even AVR, ST elevation in some things that would maybe suggest more urgent therapy. But it's really, I think most look for STEMI, non-STEMI. And then the next step is patient management. And it relies on that initial thing, which you're saying is just an ECG finding. And while we know that the STEMIs, you know, likely have occlusive disease, like you're saying, they could open up. Um, but it seems like that cohort should still go to more urgent reperfusion therapy. How about, how do we, 
what I'm hearing is that there's also a subgroup within that non-STEMI cohort, and what I've been reading, probably over 25%, that may also benefit from more emergent or urgent reperfusion therapy rather than sitting on them. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, right. So Khan in 2017 did a meta-analysis of 40,000 patients with non-STEMI, found that 10,000 of them, all of them taken for angiogram the next day because they did not meet STEMI criteria, they did not meet the millimeter criteria, therefore they did not get emergent reperfusion. They went to cath lab the next day because they ruled in for myocardial infarction by troponin. And of course, patients who have <clears throat> open arteries or closed arteries all need to go to the angiogram and get a stent because they have a lesion there that could in the next year thrombose. So they all go to angiogram and it turns out that 25% of those 40,000 patients had an occluded artery at the time of the angiogram the next day. <clears throat> those patients had higher biomarkers, worse LV, the ones compared to the ones with an open artery, the ones with a non-STEMI with a closed artery had higher biomarkers, worse left ventricular function and higher mortality, about the double the mortality of the ones with an open artery. <clears throat> so we know that, at, and this is next day. Now we, all, we know that many patients who have a closed artery at the time they present to the ED open up sometime between the, the time they present and their next day angiogram, but not necessarily before they have a lot of myocardial damage. So it's, the number is even higher than 25% who have an occluded artery where you can save some myocardium if you take them to the, to the, angi to the cath suite immediately. And I wonder that's why, you know, we've seen in the literature that some of the that subgroup of NSTEMI patients do worse. They have worse outcomes. And maybe it's because we're not capturing those that we should be treating more early. I, what are your thoughts on that? Well, exactly. Like I said, in, in that study and in many, there are studies that were not included in, in that meta-analysis. And in every one of them, the patients with an open artery have lower mortality than the patients with an open artery. And it's about double for a closed artery. So say... 2.5% uh, more one-year mortality for those with an open artery, 5% mortality for those with a, with a closed artery at the time of the angiogram. And so it now, seems like we have a management plan for those patients, right? We, we just have to identify those patients that should then go more urgently to therapy. Right. We have to figure out how to identify patients who have an occluded artery when they present to the emergency department. Now, the, the EKG is extremely good at doing that if you know how to read the EKG. And so what we are did some study. of those findings, I guess, you know, that you look for outside of those standard STEMI things, you know, for someone yeah. that's novice, so, you know, what are you looking for? So for uh, it's things like R wave amplitude, loss of S wave, QT interval, T wave size. Uh, let's go, let's talk about hyper -Q T waves. They're generally defined by most people as T-wave height, but T-wave height has little to do with um, hyper-Q T-waves. It's got more to do with their bulk, their width, how fat they are, uh, how much area under the curve there is for that T-wave. Uh, it's also got everything to do with proportionality, which is completely lost in the STEMI, non-STEMI dichotomy. ST elevation, it's also a subtle ST elevation is extremely important. So all of, all of ST elevation, ST depression or T wave size should be proportional to the QRS. Patients with a very large QRS at baseline have uh, may have ST elevation that's proportional or a large T wave. Uh, it also has to do with the, the type of QRS we have. For instance, we look at normal variant ST elevation in leads V2, V3, and V4, which is sometimes called early repolarization. Those patients have large T waves. In fact, I studied 343 acute LAD occlusions and compared to 100 to 171 patients with so-called early repolarization who have ST elevation of at least one millimeter V2 to V4. The T wave size was the same in those with myocardial infarction and those with early repol. What was different was the QRS size. So the, the ratio of the T wave to the QRS was much higher in uh, acute LAD occlusion, acute OMI, than it was in early repolarization. In that study, we found that uh, we could, we found four variables. We measured uh, many, many features of all these ECGs and came up with a logistic regression formula that uses total QRS amplitude in lead V2, ST elevation at 60 milliseconds after the, T, after the J point in lead V3. Why do we use 60 milliseconds after the J point? 
because that is a, an indirect measure of T wave size. As the, uh, if there's a higher slope of the ST segment uh, at, at that point, that leads to a higher T wave. Uh, R wave amplitude in lead V4 and QT interval. And if we could make, we made a formula from those four variables, which is far more accurate than ST elevation at diagnosing uh, LAD occlusion. That was, this is all done in patients with subtle ST elevation, not with diagnostic ST elevation. Now, where can they, uh, and, I mean, you mentioned a formula that could potentially, yeah. is that available anywhere that, you know, clinicians can use? There's, I, I have an app called Subtle STEMI on uh, iPhone app. It's free. You can get it. Uh, there's a, a Android version called Smith ECG, also free on MD Calc. If you search for early repolarization, it is on there as well. There are a whole bunch of exclusions. We uh, to uh, before we studied these patients, we made sure they didn't have obvious STEMI. So, for instance, if they had Q waves in V2 to V4, they were excluded. If they had five millimeters of ST elevation, they were excluded. If they had uh, if they had just one lead that did not have upward concavity in V2 to V6, they were excluded because early repolarization virtually always has some upward concavity. Uh, and, uh, and on there are eight different exclusions there. Can't be left bottom edge block, for instance. You can't have T-wave inversion. You can't have inferior ST depression. All those things are too specific for LAD occlusion to use the formula. So once you've excluded all those things, now you have a truly subtle EKG, one that could be LED occlusion could be normal variant ST elevation. And these four variables will help you make that distinction with about 87% sensitivity and specificity, which uh, ST elevation doesn't even come close to. Now this, was, uh, this study was validated by another uh, uh, group in, Tur in Turkey. So it's not only derived, we derived and validated a three variable formula with our group, then we derived the four variable formula with our group and the, Tur the Turks uh, validated the four variable formula. So it works. In, in their study, ST elevation was 20% sensitive. The formula was 85% sensitive. So you have a derived, validated, even externally validated you know, algorithm, which is one way, this is kind of at least the OMI, the occlusion MI, uh, that's one diagnosis. Are there any other patterns that uh, you know, we should yeah. clue in on? Yes, for instance, uh, we published on inferior myoclonal infection, and we found that any amount of ST depression in AVL uh, in a patient who is at high risk for ACS is, it, first of all, it's never pericarditis. So people with ST elevation 2, 3, and AVF of any amount, doesn't have to be one millimeter, uh, and have, uh, especially if they have ST elevation in the, the lateral leads, V4 to V6 are often blown off as pericarditis. But we found that not a single case of pericarditis had any ST depression in AVL. So if there's ST, any ST depression, like even a quarter millimeter of ST depression in AVL, it's extremely specific for inferior MI. We combined with a Spanish uh, cohort and found that 99% of inferior myocardial infarction, OMI, had some ST depression in AVL. So if there's zero ST depression in AVL, it's very unlikely to be inferior MI. Uh, and if there's any ST depression there, it's very likely to be in FMI. So AVL is a very, very important lead for that. This year, we published on ST depression in uh, leads V1 to V4. So uh, it's been shown in the past that, that normal individuals hardly ever have any ST depression uh, in V2 and V3 especially. So on, uh, on some individuals, unusual, may have up to a half a millimeter of ST depression in lead V2, uh, but it's very unusual. And so anybody who comes in with, uh, who's at suspicion for acute coronary syndrome, who has any amount of ST depression in V1 to V4, uh, in our study it was 96% specific for occlusion MI, for OMI, affecting the posterior wall. Are you so, looking for uh, contiguous leads in that? Uh... Uh, we it only it only had to be in one lead, okay. but uh, not contiguous leads necessarily. All it usually is in in V two and V three, often V four. Now the one of the big points of this is if you see it in V five, if it's maximal in V five and V six, then it's much less likely to be only there. Are, it can be about thirty three percent of the time patients with ST depression in V five and V six 
were due to OMI, but usually it's due to diffuse subendocardial ischemia, which means that the artery is open, but not with transmural ischemia. So the point of the paper was if the ST depression of any amount, even 0.5 millimeters in V2 to V4, excuse me, V1 to V4, then it's posterior OMI until proven otherwise. It's really interesting, you know, and there's a lot I want to ask you. We can look at, you know, even AVR or some of the work in uh, which I, you know, when I teach, I still teach it as the uh, Smith uh, modified Scarbosa criteria. So the left bundle branch and, and all these are different. What I'm hearing, occlusion MI, we, you know, the definition or people are calling them STEMI equivalents, but maybe we just call them as they are, right? Occlusion MIs, OMI. So, um you know, I, I wonder, are there any maybe benign mimickers uh, that we should look out for? Or what are your, any other thoughts? Well, there, well, there are a lot of benign mimickers. Uh, so, for instance, I told you about the ST elevation in inferior leads with a little bit of ST depression in AVL. We excluded patients with LVH, left bundle branch block, and WPW because those things can also cause those findings. So those are mimickers. Um, Patients with um, Takotsubo is the most difficult mimicker of all, and it's nearly impossible to tell the difference on the ECG between uh, uh, especially a wraparound left anterior descending artery occlusion and Takotsubo. If it's Takotsubo with ST elevation, much, much Takotsubo presents only with T-wave inversion, which then it's not such a problem, but uh, very often it presents with diffuse ST elevation that is basically indistinguishable. And why is it indistinguishable? Because the, the cellular pathophysiology, we believe, is the same, that it's, tra trans it's diffuse ischemia of all those cells due to small vessel constriction due to catecholamine outpouring. So that's why you can't tell the difference. It's the same basic underlying cell cellular electrophysiology. So there's we can go on for forever with this. I, I guess the before we close here, what are, if you had to just recap some of the, the key takeaways in terms of, say, the novice interpreter doesn't never heard of this, what is maybe one or two or a few findings they should first look at as they're learning about this whole new potential paradigm? Uh, first, I'd say that the paradigm is not based on the ECG. It's based on what is the underlying pathology? And the ECG, if you're, if you're the best ECG interpreter in the world, you may get up to 90% sensitivity, whereas ST elevation gets about 40% 40, 40 sensitivity. So ST elevation at the cutoffs. So one, don't ignore uh, subtle ST elevation. Subtle ST elevation is very likely to be acute OMI, especially if they're associated findings, such as Q waves, such as large T waves, I won't say tall T waves, but large T waves. Get used to looking at how, uh, the size of a T wave compared to the QRS, because proportionality is everything. Get used to looking at the size of um, the amount of ST elevation compared to the QRS. If you have a tiny QRS with half a millimeter of ST elevation, that's a high proportion and is very likely to be due to ischemia. If you have something, we started something called terminal QRS distortion. In a lead which should have an S wave, if the S wave is not there, that's an indication that it's acute OMI. We have many cases where the artery opens and closes. When the artery closes, the S wave disappears. When the artery opens, the S wave reappears. When the artery closes, the S, it doesn't have anything to do with ST elevation. It has to do with the QRS. So the entire, don't ignore the rest of the ECG. And then when it comes to mimickers, whenever you see something that worries you in the STT part of the QRS, look at the QRS. The first thing I do when I see something that I think is ischemia is I examine the QRS to make sure that those findings are not a result of an abnormal QRS, such as ST depression V1 to V4 is frequently due to right ventricular hypertrophy, ST elevation in V1 to V4 frequently due to LVH or left bundle branch block. So always look at the QRS, examine it closely, and then interpret the ST T waves in the context of the QRS. And finally, I would say, this is not there. I've got I've the way I've come with these formulas is I've been looking I've been looking at EKGs for 30 years. I've been fascinated by them, and I'm a little bit strange. I have a little bit of an autistic mind. When I I can recognize you better by your EKG than I can by your face. So that's how weird I am. So I've been I've been trying for years. What do I see in an EKG? that other people aren't seeing. Why do I see it? And all these formulas I've come up with 
have to do with what, try me trying to figure out what is it, what it is I see that others don't. But my point in this is it's a visual diagnosis, it's pattern recognition. And the more you see, the more you, the better you'll get at this. And you have to see literally thousands of these to become an expert at it. So don't think you're going to like read one paper or read uh, a few blog posts and get, and get to know this or follow a couple of rules. It, it just doesn't work that way. The, 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 the ultimate uh, goal of this then, of course, is neural networks. Because really, I don't think, um, as far as ECG reading, I don't think physicians, uh, a high percentage of physicians are ever going to get to that point. It's just too much work, and they have many other things they need to learn. So we need to train neural networks in, in this. That's the ultimate goal. But in the meantime, don't forget that you might be missing an OMI when you look at an EKG. That's the bottom line. You might be missing it. And, and how are you going to figure out if it's something else? Well, you're going to, you may have to do uh, an immersion echocardiogram. You may have to, uh, you know, if the first troponin comes back a little bit, if, even if the first troponin is negative, it still could be an occlusion MI. So you have to keep your index of suspicion high, keep doing serial EKGs, compare it with an old EKG, and you may ultimately even have to do an angiogram that turns out negative if you're not going to miss this. If you miss it, the patient loses myocardium, maybe gets congestive heart failure, certainly has a, a shorter uh, lifespan. So don't miss this opportunity. That's, that's, that's it. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, when we're learning ECGs initially, we learn about all these criteria and things. And that's kind of the basics. We need that foundation to then be able to approach this. But it is really the pattern recognition. And with AI and deep learning and now in the form of convolutional neural networks, that is it. It's able to capture, you know, subtle cardiac biosignal changes that may be able to, you know, adapt and do it so way better than a clinician can. And we're, you know, like drinking from the fire hose with all these new devices, new medical literature that we're trying to keep up with. And so, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to you know, replace the clinician, but also just serve as an adjunct. And if it could benefit our patients, it's amazing. The one final question I have, uh, just for those that are, you know, new or learning this process, are there any maybe clinical contexts, whether it's chest pain or presentation, you mentioned troponin, are there any other key factors aside from this patterns, all these that you look for or that are, you know, highly specific uh, for an occlusion MI? Well, there are patients who present with the, the absolute, the, the new onset crushing chest pain they've never had before. Those patients, that, that symptom is fairly specific for uh, occlusion MI. Fairly specific. I, I don't have a good specificity for it, but maybe 50% specific for it. But unfortunately, the majority of occlusion MI do not present with classic symptoms. And they may just have a, a, a shoulder pain or a jaw pain or epigastric pain. And uh, you're going to miss them if you're depending on a classic presentation of crushing substernal chest pain. Yeah. And the more we, you know, with experience, you, you start to see that occurring more often, that it's not the textbook mm -hmm. presentation or the textbook ECG as we're seeing today. Uh, and, and I would also add that it, as with every test, you use your pretest probability. So if somebody comes in with um, syncope only, no chest discomfort at all, no shortness of breath, and their ECG has some subtle finding of occlusion, I'm much less likely to diagnose occlusion than if they came in with shortness of breath, shoulder pain, jaw pain, because syncope without any other symptoms is an unusual uh, uh, symptom of ACS, although it can be, so it, it may be, but it, every, the higher the pretest probability, the lower, the lower your, uh, the, the less specificity you need on your ECG and other testing, the, the lower your pretest probability, the higher you need on your, on your testing. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's, that's a key takeaway, that pretest probability with any diagnostic test. Can I make one more point? Yes, please. Um, a lot of people spend, a lot of emergency physicians spend a lot of time uh, studying the ECG and dysrhythmias. And I always say that emergency physicians should spend more time on studying the ECG in occlusion of mind. Why is that? That's because when you have a dysrhythmia, you know you have a problem. The rhythm's either fast, slow, or irregular. 
And when the rhythm is fast, slow, or irregular, you can get help from a cardiologist, and the cardiologist is happy to help you because they, they too understand there's a problem. On the other hand, if you get a patient who has some vague chest discomfort and has an, uh, an ECG that shows occlusion MI on it, your, your cardiologist will be a lot less interested because he's not convinced that there is a problem because the vast majority of people who come in with vague chest discomfort do not have acute coronary syndrome. They have reflux esophagitis or chest wall pain or whatever. And you as an emergency physician will also think, oh, this is nothing. So you will only know that it's something if you can recognize those findings of occlusion MI on the ECG. Yeah, and, and I think as you've probably seen uh, over the years, the ECG with all we learn in medical training uh, has almost become a lost art, yet uh, it still remains one of the most important diagnostic tools. And like you said, even on the front lines, our emergency medicine providers already <laughs> overwhelmed, but this is one thing that we, we want to miss, not miss. And so I, I guess focusing on what is the critical thing, uh, occlusion MI, like you said, the rhythms, as long as you can stabilize the unstable and get help when needed, I think you're right. The occlusion MI is something that we need to do better with education uh, to ensure that you know the next treatment is, is not missed because we have a treatment for it. And um, right. such a good point. Now, important yeah. clinical decisions are made each day by way of the ECG. When interpreted correctly, this simple, non-invasive, and rapid diagnostic tool can not only save lives, but also improve patient outcomes. It is now more evident than ever that we need updated ECG diagnostic criteria for acute myocardial infarction based on underlying pathophysiology to guide clinical decision-making and deliver the high-quality care our patients deserve. Dr. Smith, what an incredible work you have done and continue to contribute to the field of electrocardiology. You are a respected leader, an educator, and a pioneer in this space. I'm grateful for this opportunity, and I cannot wait to see the patient lives impacted by your work on a global scale. On behalf of our team, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.